The second very important complication which can kill the patient if you don't treat him in the casualty, hyperkalemia. How do you identify? The ECG monitor will be sh showing tall peak T waves will be there, indiscernible P waves, P waves will not be seen at all, T waves will be like very tall. So this is how the patient is paraded to you. So whenever hyperkalemia is there, what is the, your acute management doctor, first thing you will cry and shout for, please get me insulin with glucose drip, push insulin with glucose, what will it do? Insulin will move the potassium which is in the extracellular environment into intracellular location, it drives transcellular shift and uh, bring down the potassium levels then sister get the calcium gluconate ready why because hyperkalemia can lead to cardiac arrest so to protect the heart from the effects of the hyperkalemia you need to be ready to push calcium gluconate then you will be giving resins which will be able to purge out the potassium from the body and you are also ready with terbutaline like beta 2 agonistic agents which also will cause a transcellular shift of the potassium from extracellular into intercellular environment and bring down the potassium potassium levels down. So tell me doctor what are the five things? Hyperkalemia management you are not going to forget. Glucose, dextrose plus insulin. Calcium gluconate. Not to bring down the levels of potassium. Why do you give calcium gluconate? To protect the heart from going into cardiac arrest because of hyperkalemia. Number three. Beta 2 agonistic agent like turbutaline. Number 4, giving resins to purge out the potassium from the body. Ultimately, if the patient's potassium is not coming down, then it becomes an indication for dialysis. To get rid of the potassium from the body is what you need to ultimately remember. Then, the third challenge in a patient of acute renal failure is metabolic acidosis. What is the reason for it? Kidney is expected to get rid of the H plus ions from the body. How will kidney can do that uh, responsible job every day in and day out, doctor going back to your nephron physiology? It is the distal convoluted tubule collecting duct which secrete the H plus into the tubular fluid. For that, what will, how will they secrete? Basically, they produce ammonia from, from where? From where will they produce ammonia? Glutamine converts into glutamate and release ammonia. And that ammonia binds with H+, forms NH4+, and that is secreted into the urine. That's how the distal convoluted tubules and collecting duct are involved in the secretion of H+. The moment renal failure is there, the ability of the kidney to lose and get rid of the H plus is lost. Hence, there is a development of acidosis. How do you want to basically manage it? If it is very severe, if the acidosis is very severe, then that becomes an indication for giving sodium bicarbonate. But what is the main challenge to give sodium bicarbonate in a patient of ARF? Why you are worried? to give sodium bicarbonate to treat acidosis in ARF, two reasons. Number one, sodium bicarbonate itself being fluid will worsen the fluid overload and worsen the pulmonary edema, number one. Number two, sodium bicarbonate will promote intracellular acidosis in the myocardial cells. If you give sodium bicarbonate, all that bicarbonate will convert into carbonic acid which will release H plus ion which will increase intracellular acidosis inside the myocardial cells and the myocardium can go into cardiac arrest. Because of these two reasons you are worried for giving bicarbonate but still you have to give bicarbonate if the acidosis is severe enough. Then hypocalcemia is another important thing that you need to manage in a patient of ARF. There can be hyponatremia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia. Accordingly, you need to manage in a patient of ARF. And the very product, urea, can't be lost out of the body. 
Hence, there is uremia. So, there is a reason uh, you need to get rid of this uremic state either by doing acutely dialysis. Acutely dialysis you need to do in order to get out of the effects of the uremia in a patient of uh, um, in a patient of ARF is what need to be remembered. Then uh, any drug which can jeopardize the blood flow to the kidney should be stopped. For example, your patient of ARF is a also a patient of heart disease. He had been prescribed aspirin. By whom? By his primary physician. Now he is in a state of ARF. So you need to eliminate NSAIDs from his uh, everyday drugs because NSAIDs, aspirin are known to worsen the ARF is what need to be remembered. Similarly, to treat his infection if he is already on drugs like aminoglycosides which can worsen renal failure, you need to remove them from his prescription. Then any radio contrast agent should not be given in a patient of ARF. For example, you are suspecting renal artery stenosis in a patient of ARF. How can you prove that? Only by doing renal arteriography for which you need to pass the contrast. When the creatinine is high, can you be able to afford to give contrast? No. So there's a reason always, whenever you need to give any contrast to a patient for an interventional procedure, evaluate his baseline creatinine. If it is in a risky phase, don't give acutely the radio contrast agents is what need to be remembered. Then the most important decision in the management of ARF is that fine balance of electrolytes and fluids. If you are very callous and you told the nurse, Okay, this patient of ARF whom we have diagnosed, there is no special skill required to diagnose ARF. It is clearly evident with the high creatinine, with acidosis, with uremia and the patient in a gasping state. You say that give him fluids and if the nurse happened to give inadvertently too much fluids, patient won't die because of renal failure, he will die because of pulmonary edema. You have to be very miserly in prescribing the fluids to a patient of acute renal failure. At the same time, see to that he gets adequate fluids. There's a whole challenge. He should not be volume overloaded. So how will you judge that? Your input-output chart, no? which you maintain in the acute medical care unit, is a very, very important thing. The morning you walk in as a house surgeon, you need to carefully watch how is the Foley catheter, how much urine is formed, and how much fluids have gone into the patient. You must carefully manage between input-output analysis. Otherwise, patient will go into pulmonary edema. Suppose if the nurse says, doctor, the entire yesterday patient passed only 200 ml urine only. How much fluid did you give if you ask the nurse if she says I gave him 2 liters. So 2 liters has gone in 200 ml has come out. Who will take care of 1800 ml left over? No sir it is all summer no it might have evaporated. Maybe an explanation of your nurse but don't believe those explanations. So you need to be very careful. If 500 ml went inside had gone inside you expect 500 ml to come out. Otherwise, patient will go into pulmonary edema. So, input output must be carefully monitored. Electrolytes are those rats that roar like lions when it comes to mortality session. Because uh, they are simple rats, you can manage them. You have a stick, you manage them. If you don't manage them properly, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, they will roar like lions and lead to mortality. So, that's the reason a good Good acute care physician is which kind of a guy you are going to become? The one who knows how to manage fluids, how to manage hyperhypokalemia, hyperhyponatremia, hyperhypocalcemia thoroughly and not let the patient die because of stupid reasons which are highly manageable. Electrolytes and fluids are very, very important. If the patient is having a symptomatic uremia, intractable acidemia 
अनकंट्रोलेबल हाइपर कैलीमिया और अनमैनेजेबल फ्लूड ओवरलोड पल्मोनरीडिमा इन स्पाइट ऑफ गिविंग डायरेटिक्स दे बिकम द स्ट्रॉंग इंडिकेशंस वेब यू नीड टू ऑर्डर फॉर डायलिसिस एंड गेट रिड ऑफ देम फ्रॉम द बॉडी दैट्स वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड लेट मी टेल यू डॉक्टर ए गुड फिजिशियन बैड फिजिशियन इन एक्यूट केयर मेडिसिन हाउ डू दे डिफर only by two simple things they differ when you are expected to run when you are expected to aggressive if you sit like the king drutrashtra let me check there shall not be any war if you keep saying patient will die and uh, when it is the time to go slow there is no urgency for example diabetic ketoacidosis patient is having acidosis Do you need to give sodium bicarbonate to manage the acidosis? Not required. You give him insulin, you and good rehydration. Patients acidosis will because acidosis because of ketones. Ketones are found because of lack of insulin. If you replenish the insulin, ketones are gone. If ketones are gone, acidosis is gone. There is no need of bicarbonate. But as a patient of uremia, if you don't manage his acidosis aggressively. and at that time if you sit silently let me check tomorrow morning maybe acidosis will go it won't go it will take the patient along with it so you need to be ready and take a decision when to run when to walk slowly when to sit and manage all the decision making brings earth and sky difference in mortality when you are managing tomorrow the reason you must know uh first the physiology pathophysiology and keep taking right and wrong decisions regularly as a house surgeon you kill 10 people because of your wrong decision 11th person onwards you will be more right and if you have not uh, taken a decision at all and always you are a passive bystander in the clinical rounds that's not the way medicine is learned or practiced